Welcome to the Top M&A Entrepreneurs. Today, my guest is Thomas Lee Maguire. Uh, from sure. uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Republics, a uh, sharply dressed guy, definitely overdressed than I usually am, but uh, welcome to the show. Great to, uh, great to be here, John. Thanks for having me. So let's go a little bit back. You and I started talking a year ago. We were talking about reggae because you're probably raising money for your company. Uh, you recall that conversation? I, I do recall that. Yes. Yeah. So I wasn't doing, I was in it, but I'm not doing it anymore because we focused on OTC companies. Anyway, you also know a guy that I known for a couple of years is Trevor Turnbull. He owned a agency called LinkedIn to leads agency, uh, which acquired uh, irrational acquired LinkedIn to leads and then uh, evolved into republics. Correct. And you've made about 10 acquisitions since then, which are Arcane, Media Mechanics, Tag, Source Strike, Noodle Wave, Bantio.io, and Pedestal. Pretty amazing, which means you're doing almost 38 million in revenue and 10 million in EBITDA. Correct. On a pro forma trailing 12 month basis. Nice. Very nice. So let's talk about how this all started. Now, how did you get, wh where did the inspiration to go, I'm just going to do this company and then, you know what, we can grow faster. We just acquire. How did that start? Oh, man. So I started with Irrational Marketing. We're growing 50 to 100% a year organically. And the vision has always been to build the number one growth platform in the world that can connect a small business owner to the perfect combination of marketing services delivered automatically with accountability. So easy, predictable, organic growth for business owners. That's been the vision. And my partner and I, um, Nicolas Léger, he's my co-founder, we're like, you know what? Like, how can we grow faster? There's no way that we're achieving our dreams of being this number one platform, number one and number two, um, uh, having enough customers to have critical mass within the SMB space because there's 400 million small businesses worldwide. Plenty of room, plenty of space. Plenty of room, plenty of room, right? And so we said, you know what? Let's go ahead and acquire all the big wealth that was done in the past has been done through, a lot of it's been done through acquisition. So I started digging more into that. And then uh, met my mentor, Dan, who became Dan, my chairman. Dan, who's that? Uh, Dan Pena. Oh, Dan Pena. Okay, we know him. He's the all caps guy. All caps, like, all, all red. Cap, all the way, yeah. Yes. And, and salty so, salty uh, talk, too. <laughs> yes, there's that as well. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where I always like distinguish things, you know, what is the message and what is the messenger? And I've, I've been very blessed to be able to separate the two because the man speaks the truth. And I didn't always want to hear it. Most of the time, I don't want to hear it, actually. But, uh, but, um, but he's taught me a lot. I'm very, very grateful. So there is a lot. I, I have to stop you and ask you about this because there's a lot of courses out there from Carl Allen to Roland Fraser, Dan Pena, uh, the uh, number of them. What what does Dan teach different than these guys? Why did he resonate with you versus all these other guys? I um, I well I I know Roland Fraser because of his connection to digital marketer, but yeah. I didn't know that he was teaching acquisitions. I haven't learned about these other folks either. Um, because frankly, as soon as I okay, so let me backtrack in terms of like uh uh my philosophy in terms of learning. Um, so I'm a concert pianist. I, I also um, became a gold level ballroom dancer while I was a kid. Um, then I got a black belt in martial arts. Then I learned all of these things and how to master them at, at a young age. Cause like my parents trained me that way. And I was like, well, what was the difference? How did they train me? number one? always get the best coach. How do you determine the best coach? Look at the results. Based on that, it's not because you have results that you know how to teach. So then it's also the transference of that knowledge and then habit. 
right? So I, I learned that from my past. And so every single time I wanted to take the next step in terms of my evolution, I always looked at who's done it, who's done it with repeated success, because that equals a process or a methodology. And I know that that's the foundation of, of success. And then what I need to bring to the table is work ethic and habit, right? And so I said, if, if there's a person who has the system, and it seemed that that was the case, and I was right in, in seeing that, then I'm, I'm very much one to say, I, I will follow blindly. Because I understand that to achieve something that I've never achieved before, I got to do something that I've never done. So it's kind of a weird blind faith kind of a thing, right? Yeah. So I embarked on that 2019. I became one of his uh, fastest uh, deals um, from start to finish. I think you mean you mean day. taking his training to first acquisition? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Like a board, dream team, all, all these things, accountants, lawyers, professionals, everything done and then deal closed. And that deal was Trevor, right? And so that's how it comes full circle. But that, that's how I got connected with Dan. That's how um, I judged his merit. And, um, and again, I just looked at the message. And yeah. I was like, there's truth here. Let me take a leap of faith. So what is that message? I mean, I, I, I haven't taken Dan Pena's, but I've taken a number of other the other courses like uh, Carl Allen, Jeremy Harbour. I just bought his book. And then I went through Roland's that you're unaware of. What is this message that, and I'll tell you this, there's another guy, Jason Paul Rogers, who's killing it down in Florida. He's a Dan Pena student. So the, the premise behind it, and this is just, you know, my interpretation of it is that generational wealth is built through a series of transactions. One, two, it's not hard. So it's an easy process. What's hard is the emotional aspect of it and the fact that we're hardwired to be weak or to succumb or wanting to be liked. And that's kind of like a premise of like more the, the, the emotional and the um, personal aspect. So if I really look at what his methodology is, it's really around how to be a high performance individual and how super wealthy, successful people think. And it's just so different than conventional wisdom. So that's another aspect. And saying that the, the, the next one is if you follow this system, it will work for you too. Because here's an 80 IQ guy who did it. Here's a 180 IQ guy who did it. Here's somebody who like literally had Down syndrome, did it. Tens of millions. And so you, you see case after case after case after case. And you're like, well, huh, dang, if, 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 if that person can do this, I can too. Right? So it's very methodology driven. And I, I really appreciated that. So there's a, um, there's a, and so core premise is you can do it, become a high performance person, but it's not for everybody. And the sooner you can come to that determination, the better that you're high performance or not. The other one is this angle of the psyche and the psychology of being a high performer and beating out all the bad habits we have in us that prevent us from achieving super success. And then executing along this methodology that how he endearingly calls us his meatheads, how any meathead could go ahead and do this if they were to just follow the system. And that if you aren't getting success, it wasn't the system because the system is proven to work. It's you. So in, interesting. Yeah. That's so interesting. You know, when you took this system and reached out to, uh, Trevor Turnbull, LinkedIn to leads. Now, were you offering him creative financing, such as like a dealer finance, uh, seller financing, or earn out, or or were you just offering him money for his operation? How did that conversation go with Trevor? Yeah, no, well, you know, on on that one there, I mean, like the 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 um, the deal is, I mean, it, it's private, but it involved seller financing. 
Um, it involved delayed consideration, some sort of burnout, and involved a little bit of cash that we found a way to do that creatively. Um, so, cause at, at the end of the day, like the, the thing that I can share is that I didn't have any money and he wanted some money and we made it happen. Yeah. So like that, that's, that, that's another distinguishing factor with Dan is zero money required. And I'm the proof of that because my first three transactions didn't involve any cash. And then my next one, still cash out of pocket, was zero. And got the bank financing done on a, on a 1.3 million EBITDA company. And then we're on our way. Yeah. So how to start from nothing, saying no excuses, nothing. You can be poor. And he came from a very poor background, which is the ghettos, right? And just being like, you can go from nothing to something. Just following the script. What's a, what was Trevor looking for? Was he looking to sell? Yes. Yeah. I, the foundation of everything is a motivated seller. Yeah. Was it so, profitable, a company? Yes. Yeah. We, we're not a turnaround model. We only buy things that make money. Yeah. yeah. Why, did he, why did he want to sell? I mean, did he said like some kind of life event that or just tired or exhausted. What was it? Well, that one there, I'll just let uh, let Trevor comment on it. Because at, at the end of the day, you know, like I, I'm free to comment on my life and the things that I've done. But yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was just trying to categorize it and like, what's the motivation? Because people, when they buy businesses, you know, they're trying to uncover what the motivation is and then address that need. Yes. I want to get out of the business because of this. Okay, let me help you solve that problem. Awesome. So then what I can do is take a cross section of the 13 deals I've done in the last two years, and, and they kind of fall in a few categories. One of them, they're tired. They're just straight up, they're tired. Yeah. So, and they want to just take some chips off the table. That's like category one. Category number two, um, they have a life event of some sort, either health related or somebody close to them is having an issue or a personal event like a divorce or a relationship issue, something happens to a child, that whole category there creates a motivated seller. The, the, those are primarily the ones that, that we work with. Let me take a look at the other ones. Yeah, the, the other ones, now the ones that we work with is that, because we're, we're not done when we acquire, them. we grow them. Yeah, the, the point is to grow them, you know, as Another mentor says, like, double EBITDA or take the top to the bottom, whatever that goal looks like. It, uh, I, I absolutely. Well, in this case, it's like double EBITDA or more. Yeah. Yeah. So from, from that standpoint, a lot of the founders that sell to us, they stay with us. So from that standpoint, they know they've hit a cap and they want more. And they understand they're at that point of their business. They could be at 10 million in revenue and, and whatever, 22 million and they'd be done. They know they want more. So then they come and join us. We give them some cash. We, we structure a deal. We roll over some equity so that they can be a part of Republics and own another, um, own the bigger thing, a smaller piece of the bigger thing. Uh, SPV up here, some kind of holding company. Yeah. 100%. And then be able to, to get another bite at the app. Is, so is Trevor or your companies that you acquire, not just Trevor, are they W, well, that's in the United States. Are they W-2s? Are they employees now? It, 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 well, yes. But they so, still own whatever's rolled over. Like if you only bought 70% of the company, let's say. Yeah. For example, like, in, and now like we really aim for 100% purchase. Um, we found that minority shareholding is just annoying. <laughs> so I was we'll go ahead and take right. care of that up front you know all right man yeah thanks uh, for being honest about that yeah, no, it yeah. works well in private equity but you know but somebody in the smaller to mid market you know it's annoying <laughs> yeah no it, it can be and also um i found that the more we can move the pieces as one especially from a cash flow standpoint, the better. Yeah. Right. And so when you have minority shareholders, it, it's, it's important to honor that. So then you can't, well, you can, 
if you structure it properly, uh, you know, participate 100% of the cash flow. I just didn't know how to do it right. <laughs> so, yeah. so, but listen, you, you live, you learn as you move along. And I know a lot of people can do it successfully with, uh, you know, just a, a, a slight majority. I, I just haven't learned how. Um, so, but yeah, so they, yes, they, they end up being W2. If not, it's just not compliant, right? Like once we have an, or, like right now we have 147 full-time equivalents, uh, that, that are working with us. Um, we're in Canada, us, UK in terms of, um, in terms of physical presence. We also have offices in Romania and Panama. So once we start dealing with this type of, um, cross border type dealing, number one, from a tax structuring standpoint, it's, it gets a little bit more complicated, but there's a lot more opportunity from a sales standpoint. That's one. But then from a human capital standpoint, it gets way more complicated. And so what we're working now on is um, unified performance management, unified um, uh, bonus and compensation structures in the way that aligns proper incentives. Um, and, and it's just part of the growing pains of what we're going on right now. Yeah, I, so- I, I have a conversation <laughs> with my buddy who owns a CPA firm and he goes, you know, five years ago, I'd get an admin for thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars. Now it's fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars. I, 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 to get that person and to get those taxes done, I need to charge a lot more to my customers. Anyway, I know that profile. Let me let me ask you about this uh, part of the question. And you know, we we recognize like Roland Fraser who can do deals all the time because he's got these pillars or columns like. He's got Digital Marker, which is a platform company that if he acquires a company, he can just take top to bottom or double EBITDA. Um, And then he's got all these uh, epic people that are kind of like bird dogs that they bring deals, siphon up the deal flow up to him. And then operations, he's got Ryan Dice and those guys, he could just go find somebody in. Now, those are the four pillars. Uh, And in finding money, investors, not a problem. Where were you at? With those four columns, you got investors, deal flow, uh, you know, taking the marketing to the next level and then operations. I mean, did you have all those in place when you started? You're just like, oh, my God, now I need those. And they're coming in one at a time. I I guess like it it really happened from necessity because I so I was already CEO, but of a smaller company, like a couple million bucks. Right. So I had okay operating chops i had good marketing sales chops um no investors and um deal flow is tied to direct marketing so indirectly deal sourcing and marketing are tied for me at least yeah so then that was state zero state one um, and I was always very creative in terms of how to do financing with no money because I didn't have any money, right? That's just been a, a, a part of my life. So um, so then the next step was then creating what we call our acquisition engine, which is a mix of direct marketing and uh, demand gen. And so I built a pipeline. We had 100 targets. My team did it like we would generate enterprise level sales. Uh, within two weeks, I had 30 some odd calls booked in my calendar of targets. Um, and then out of those, we closed two. And, and where did you get that deal flow? I mean, LinkedIn, I mean, LinkedIn and, the leads, like <laughs> that's yeah. a great place to start, right? Yeah, well, that one there was, was network. I I knew Trevor, we were doing work together previously. And I was like, oh, your product line would really nicely match um, Irrational's product line. It'd create an extension. Let's let's just be better together. That was the conversation there. So there's different types of deals. That one was more of a warm network kind of deal. Yeah. Versus Arcane was cold outreach. My tag was cold outreach. Um, So... And then, so I built this deal engine and it's one of the strongest aspects of my business because when we fire it up, if there's a hundred targets on those hundred targets, I'll get like 40 calls of those 40 calls. I'll go ahead and close five or six predictably within six months. I'll own those businesses. Yeah. 
So deals were fine. From a from an investor standpoint, well, well, let, me, let me ask you about the deal. So, where are those deals coming from? Is it just reaching out directly, with direct mail, Facebook ad, LinkedIn, and like yeah, LinkedIn, and then we enrich our data. So we 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 kind of have a, a LinkedIn email call sequence, but we've never made it to the call. Yeah, it'll just get like LinkedIn email and then calendar slam for two weeks. I do those calls LOIs within 30 to 40 days. And then from there, 60 days to close. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the deal side. And then on the um, on the capital side, um, our model is dead driven. So it was all around commercial finance. And so it wasn't until the end of last year, really, that we raised uh, a small slug of equity. So we really built this off well, of debt. Well, okay, okay. So let's go to the the debt now. How are a lot of these companies I saw you have are kind of digital marketing, IP software? Was that off of uh, cash flow? Yes. Debt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because debt period. When when we're looking at commercial debt at like really good rates, um, is, is always based on cash flow. So then it was finding the right kind of lenders and there's a process for that. And it took a lot of effort. I, I got a shit ton of notes. Like I, I've probably spoken to 250 lenders. Easily yeah. one-on-one, dragged along, nothing. Nah. But then you find a few of them that are just like, oh, I like your deal. I'm going to back another one and another one. And then they'll do two, three of them with you per year. Right. So we built up that way initially for the first couple of years until at the end of last year, um, we, uh, we did a, a large financing, $70 million. Um, so you raised $70 million with, uh, what kind of raise was that? Reg A or, uh, no, no, this, this is debt. This yeah. is debt oh, okay. facility. So it, uh, it took out our, our, our current debt and just gave us a longer AM. Like in Canada, it's usually five year, uh, five year terms, five year AM, which is hard. The U.S. you get ten year, you get all this on twenty year. It's crazy down there. So like, uh, so it extended our our AM, really good interest rate. You recapitalized on how many companies? Like, um, at that point in time, we six plus three, maybe like ten. Ten of them. It three con- concurrent closes with that recap. Yeah. And it also gave us a $30 million dry powder acquisition facility, um, a $5 million revolver, and a $5 million CapEx line that we could go ahead and deploy for technology development because we also have a, a tech component to, uh, to our business to be able to properly map and automate the different growth services that we have to better service our customers, right? So, so all that happened with one um, with one provider, which again, helps us simplify. Yeah. That's where, again, now we got to just professionalize it and really grow up, um, just from a a corporate standpoint, from a team standpoint. And that goes to the final step of operations. I was ill-equipped, John. (laughs) So Uh, then we're, we're at a stage now of professional managers. So what I've learned there and my board guided me through it, just, forcefully yet gracious, graciously. I'm, I'm grateful for it. Right, would you say, how, how would you say you're in that role? I mean, you like let somebody else do it. The reason I bring this up is, you know, who Andrew Wilkins is in is in tiny capital. I think he's bought. Yeah. 30, 30 I've, yeah. I've heard of his name. I, I, but I've heard his name and I've heard of tiny cap. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I saw, I haven't interviewed him, but I'd love to. And I saw him on a podcast and he goes, my job is turned in into hiring and firing CEOs. So it's, it's not far off. It's, it's not far off because one is getting the most out of your people um, and helping them jump to a higher standard, but not everyone, who, everybody wants to do that. One, two is, the team that gets you to point A is not the team that necessarily gets you to point B. I also had to realize that and we had to cycle out management. So yeah. then you get to learn these things, but the only way you can learn is by doing it. 
All right, I got to fire this one. I got to fire this other person for cause. Okay, now we're litigating. I, I mean, how, how else do you learn that? You, yeah. you just can't, right? So, so from that standpoint, now what, what you know, my board showed me was saying, listen, you're at, you're at 38 million in revenue. Now's the time to go ahead and set the right foundation financially on the financial capital side and on the human capital side of the business. Make sure they're both strong with very strong leaders. So then we um, hired one of the top recruiting firms here in Canada. They were expensive and they sourced some top, top, top notch candidates. And we interviewed the shit out of them. Yeah. And so now we're, we're at a point now of bringing these two leaders of the two capital sides of our business. And we already have somebody very strong at the level of growth and sales. And so we're, we're building out these functions, right? And then once we have those leaders, those leaders hire their respective teams. So then on the finance side, we'll get FP&A function so that we have forward looking capabilities. And then we'll have the controller function. We already have a controller, but it, um, uh, in-house controller function uh, for all the historic capabilities, right? Then we'll have the right pillars to be able to, to move quickly, right? So listen, man, like it's a, it's a lot of just getting your face kicked in because yeah. I wasn't, I, I, I've never been this big from a company standpoint. I've never grown this fast. Th- Thomas, I, I don't know if you know, I looked in the mirror, but you're a super achiever. You were destined to be in this role. So <laughs> well, thanks. It, it comes with the trashing, but it's a, uh, it's, it's a good time, man. Yeah. Like, I, I just feel grateful that, uh, I got a super supportive wife. We've been married 16 years now. I've been though I look 10. I have five sons with her. Um, and they bring just a tremendous amount of joy. There's a lot of darkness in entrepreneurship. There's some really dark places you go and and it's sometimes super hard to get out of there. Yeah. Uh, I've been there many times and then I just look so at the who do you go to sons. for uh, light? Like what mentors, people? Do you seek, seek out, not necessarily directly, but their material? So I guess not, I, from a material standpoint, I mean, I, I pray and I meditate every day. Yeah. Like Dan Sullivan or Tony Robbins or, you know, Hey, I just got a phone call with, uh, you know, Richard Branson. He said, do this, this, and this like, Oh my God, that was so, you know, brilliant. Yeah. I guess like I, ever, ever since meeting Dan, one of the things that I do is that I, is that I internalize a mentor and then in some ways become that person and then find a new balance of who I am plus the best traits of what I acquired from them, so to speak, right? Sure, sure. I had a mentor um, while well, he was my guru, and this was maybe 14 years ago, and he taught me everything about spirituality. And I got initiated in all the different religions, and I learned meditation and and um, in all these different things to be able to connect to the source. That was very important for me. That's my spiritual side. And then it swung on to this business side and saying, okay, I'm a spiritual man in, in a material world. How do I drive that? So frankly, for the last two years, like 90% of what I listen to is, is Dan. So his old recordings from the 90s, from now, from him yelling at me, from everything, I just review tape. Because I remember um, my mom, she's the one that taught me barn dancing. I hated it, but I became very good at it. And then, uh, and then I realized you will end up loving anything you're good at. I got and- a, a question about that because I have interviewed sure. 59 now people and the real <laughs> super achievers like you have told me that I, you know, first I didn't do this, but I said, well, where are you getting your answer questions answered now and i do that lately and they're all of them are telling me i get i surround myself with people who are smarter than me if i'm doing 10 million dollars i want to hang around people doing 100 million which is masterminds and i'm, I'm not in any one of those yet so i have my sights on it but uh that's kind of something i've learned over that yeah. uh, it's it, it's true you you are who you hang around with. yeah right it, it's a true max and you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with so, you know, when, when I look at my board and, and the folks that I get to deal with there, like they're playing at another level and, and they're holding me to account. That's the thing, like as entrepreneurs, how often do we get to be held accountable, right? And like, 
I felt that wrath, but it either breaks you or it makes you. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that it's making me at this stage. Like steel is made by being hammered in the forge. And so I, I would say that's, that's probably my, my greatest gift is my, my wife calls it the, uh, uh, the gift of long suffering. Yeah. I got that, you know, which is, which is kind of screwed up, but, but, but it is what it is. The other one is like my professionals, like BDO does my accounting, PWC does my due diligence and audit, like Galling's my, my legal counsel, like, and they're all senior partners. So I, I speak with them consistently. Yeah. They're game players, right? They're not fucking around. So these are the folks that I get to interact with on my day to day and I work a lot and the rest of the time I'm with my family. So it's, it's helping me evolve this way while I'm working, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I, I like, I'm, I'm looking back at your page about your advisors, Daniel Pena, Ron Forbes from corporate finance city group, Bob Coffey, ex vice chairman at KPMG, Jason Swank, Eric Varden. Mike Warren, Andrew Lamb. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, like the because the the best lens that I can have, John, to be able to look forward is by having people that have been there and that can be my eyes. Because where I am today, I don't know. I need them to know so that I can ask them, yeah, what the fuck do I do now? <laughs> 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 they guide me right yeah so so it's it's yeah what's so what are you wanting to go i mean 50 100 million and then sell or keep or what ah, the the markets are pretty intense right now right so Not we're, we're, we're we're focused right now on just like squeezing everything out of our organization i mean we're already profitable but it comes down to well we might as well be the best that we can be, let's be in rarefied air. Because if we're looking at private equity, public markets, strategic buyers, whoever they are, now it's a flight to quality. Private equity and strategics are, are sitting on records amount of cash, but they're only gonna deploy it on the best. So we wanna have the highest margins, we wanna have the highest recurring revenue, we, want, we wanna be growing organically at a solid double digit clip. Um, these things matter, have a very professional team that can handle the acquisitions that, that I would be looking to do on a go forward. But I mean, like we're, we're, we're sitting on $30 million worth of dry powder. Like, I can now, Is that dry powder? Is that, I want to go back to that, that capital. Is that debt or is that equity? Just yeah, debt. Aside, and aside from you owning hundred percent of the company doing that debt, I mean, I'm looking at the numbers, 38 million top line, 10 million EBITDA, 26 percent that's a software companies uh are any of these companies kind of like uh recurring revenue SaaS stuff where you get the higher multiples yeah so i mean it's uh um we've got 60 60 percent monthly recurring and that was at december 31st so we're probably at like 63 maybe 64 percent mrr or arr then we've got a total of 81 to 83%. Again, it must've grown since then. We haven't run that analysis because we haven't gone to market, but that would be recurring, which is MRR, ARR, and reoccurring revenue, which would then be contractual, but it's not as even, but you know how much you're gonna get that year, but it might be 50K one month, 10K another, nothing, another one, 60K another month, but you know you're gonna get 300 grand on the year, right? That's reoccurring. And that historically, we know we have that customer for the last five years, six years, you know, it's coming, right? And then the rest is project based. So because of that revenue profile, um, we, we can do some, some, some pretty good damage. Right? Yeah. Um, so there's that. But with the 30 million in dry powder, I could probably do another 13, 12 to 13 million more in it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, I, I, I suspect that like, Sorry. No, please go ahead. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. I, 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 your numbers are incredible, especially with the uh, reoccurring revenue that uh, somebody's going to want to say, hey, man, please take our money equity. Please take it. Um, and you don't want it? Or are you okay with debt? Or I love debt. You love, I love debt. debt. Okay. That being said, 
um, when we have our strong foundation laid, like a really just, and I feel that that's going to be here in the coming 90 days. We just got to make sure our, our team is very strong, that our, 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 our accountability and processes are very strong. Um, and otherwise, then, then I think we'll be in a good position to have conversations um, um, at the level of a, a, a partner of some sort when it comes to equity. Um, we just wanted to push off that equity conversation, a meaningful equity conversation down the line after we had built a good amount of enterprise value, right? Because then it's what's best for all the shareholders. Um, so that's- yeah, I guess are you 10 million? Are you probably in the multiples like a teens now, 10 to 15, I would say. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And um so yeah, I mean we're 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 making some progress, but it still comes back to the fundamentals, John. Like, is your business any good? Uh, yeah, do customers good? need you. Yeah, do right? they do they get transformational changes out of your service or product? Right, hundred percent. It's the yeah. foundation. Like, is the customer winning? Are we providing value to the market? Um, are are we are we working as a strong team? to deliver value for each other and for the market, right? And so it's the combination of all those things. Like I, I remember one of my advisors, he said, and, and he took his company public, it was 400 million, whatever it was. Like Thomas, just focus on building a great business. If you focus on building a great business, everything was, is gonna fall into place. Yeah, yeah. Just build a great business. It's so simple. But simple is fucking hard, John. It just <laughs> is. It's a, oh yeah, no, it's business 101. That's what they told me at my board meeting today. I was like, well, it's not that easy. Yeah, it's really I'm there's three long steps. hours. Yeah, I'm getting it's three face. steps, Thomas. That's yeah, all it three is. Steps, three steps. Yeah, okay. You know? Oh my god. You get your four pillars. You get the investors, you get yourself the operations, you go and you get yourself some deals, and, and now you're making money. Okay, well, let's get into the how now and 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 the the pain you go through, but we're having a lot of fun now. Yeah, you, so you got an engine, a nice acquisition engine for your deal flow, especially with Trevor Turnbull and that group. Are you has your types of deals and your size of your deals changed because of what you're trying to do? I mean, you can't. It wouldn't make sense to go unless it was a tuck in or a roll in for a one to. Two million dollar company now is it five to ten? So the question is, it depends. So part of our restructure that we did here in Q1 was structuring our companies around customer types, and so we clustered our agencies and technology companies accordingly. So we have B to C e com mid market. We've got B to B SaaS. We've got technology and software development three clusters. So what that allows us to do is from an integration standpoint, one, because now we've launched the clusters, we've rationalized those costs, the leaderships are unified, they're working together. It, it's, it's actually really fucking cool. So what this allows us to do, let's say in 90 days, and, and of course, now we have to upgrade our financial systems to be able to consolidate on one financial platform because 10 separate QuickBook Online is just, is, is just help. It's help. Okay. Yeah, you can only have one company on the QuickBooks Online. I think it's so small. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it's, uh, so we have 10 QuickBooks Online. Yeah. Right. And so consolidation there is a real mess. Anyways, so what this allows us to do is to integrate three companies at once because each cluster has its own leadership and can integrate a company of its type. And the in- integration is immediately a creative, not just financial. Where it's like, oh, okay, like we bought you at four times and we're, we're 13 times, 15 times, whatever it is, right? There's that. But the other one is if we've got like an extra 50 customers that just came in into our business to consumer mid-market and we already have a portfolio there of 300 customers and you bring a new marketing capability, I mean, the lift. All right, let's put you in the customer matrix. Let's see. How can we get more share of wallet? How can we better serve those customers? What processes can you benefit from that we've got, right? So, um, so there's that element there from a growth standpoint, um, which, is, which is helpful. Now, 
back to the targeting question. That means that we can look at um, companies that would fit each one of those clusters. A tuck-in is very easy. So it's not even like, that's a 30-day integration. It's like, come in, let's just get her done, right? And sometimes those are really great because you get them on a cheap. So it's super creative and you're just getting them for their book of clients, maybe a marketing capability and a few key people, right? With a focus on sales and product, right? And um, the other ones, I, I think it makes more sense if you're one of the three Dokken acquisitions, it has to have a marketing or technology capability we're missing. We're looking at 80% plus MRR, but typically now we're really targeting 100%. Uh, we want to see 35% plus margins. We want to see year over year growth. Uh, we want to see a strong leadership that's going to stay with us and is inspired to go ahead and be even more focused within our group. Typically, we want to see about a million in, um, in earnings, right? At a minimum, it's nice because then there's a stability there. And, and typically, that would happen after um, they've cracked sales and some degree of marketing. Um, some kind so of the profile. profile. And then, yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly U.S. now. We really like the U.S. market. I love the U.S. market. It's yeah. My favorite. favorite. When you started uh, acquiring companies, were you kind of just going for targets? I know that Trevor Turnbull, LinkedIn to Leads, was uh, an opportunity that came to you through a warm network. Um, but then you started acquiring companies. Did you have a plan for a spoke and hub type deal? Or yeah. it was just Target? Target of our opportunities, yeah. No, no, it was uh, it was hub and spoke. Uh, so again, Dan taught me that. It's like hub and spoke within three hour drive of wherever you're at. And thank God, because when we acquired Arcane, um, they were a two hour drive away, and it was the day that our government um, mandated the state of emergency for COVID. So then suddenly, like we had a hub of like two and a half, three million worth of EBITDA within a driving distance. So that, that served me super, super well. And so now we've got a hub in London. We've got a hub around the Toronto area, which is where, where I'm at. We have a West Coast hub in Canada, which is Vancouver. We got one in LA. Um, so now it's more, okay, let's expand some of these areas um, with the next batch of acquisitions. Um, but, um, but yeah, hub and spoke, it's a, it's a, pro, a tried and tested methodology. Another Dan Pena. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I gotta kind of getting close to the end, but, uh, how did it turn out for Trevor since the acquisition? Now, I, I'm not going to ask him like, Hey, how's it working for Thomas? How's it going for you financially? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to jump into that. Uh, but I could tell by his message with just an hour ago, he was pleased with what's happening. And he's the way he wrote this, that, that it was a positive note. That's I mean, because Trevor's awesome. So the, I'll, I'll just share it in this way. Um, whatever his deal was on day one, his equity in republics today is multiples of that. Yeah. One. Two is um, he's now focusing in areas of his core genius that are producing value for republics and for him. And he's been able to focus on the things that he loves most. So that's another thing that's happened out of there. So uh, at the end of the day, like I, you know, I, I think it's gone well for Trevor. Um, and at the same time, the only person that can truly say it is him. And it yep. seems that the message he sent you is a good one. Um, but yeah, like that, that's kind of how we, we try to look at it. I, I remember in irrational marketing, we almost went under one year and a whole bunch of people got equity. I gave them equity because they went without pay for six to eight weeks with no promise of equity. They just worked and they said, we, we're going to get out of this together. Right. So I, I gave them all equity, 2%, 3%, whatever it was. We just had a shareholder call with them. Um, just last week, just be like, hey, how's it going? Here's kind of the update of where we're at. And like their positions are, are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Do they get distributions um, or is it just on exit? Just on exit. We don't yeah. do dividends. So, um, so yeah, like it, 
but that's awesome because these were employees. Yeah. So in, in the same way, when, when we're looking at, at republics, I mean, we have an option plan for, for all of our employees, right? Like that's important, better together. Let's go. Right. Cause um, wealth is, is built through equity. Well, I think at least from my limited perspective, but uh, so if we can go ahead and share that with some folks that would never have that opportunity, that's cool, right? I, I think that's kind of cool. And again, I, I would have never thought of an option plan or anything like that, but Dan's like, hey, share the wealth. Why not? And I was like, well, okay, fine. Yeah. What's uh, Where does that loyalty, obviously you instill confidence and loyalty in your leadership. You're the captain of the boat. Where did that come from in your childhood or culture or mom or dad? What did they instill in you? Or is it brand new? No, like, uh, well, just deep in me, like when, when I was 21, my wife was 19 and our first son was on the way. I was still in school and doing those things. Like we're hard up. We had no money. We had negative money. And, um, and just one of the core things is that like, I just won't abandon anybody. Just won't. It's like hardwired in me. So from, from that standpoint, it's just like you, you just keep on going until you drop dead. That, that's the end point. So I'm, I'm kind of wired that way. I also saw my mom and my dad just being ruthlessly loyal to each other through thick and through thin. And I respect that tremendously. Right. So I, at the end of the day, I think I treat my people right. Um, like I'm, I'm demanding, but I'm fair. Um, I try to be decisive, but kind, um, which is very different. Like, you know, if, if my, if, if my board had their way, it'd be like decisive and be an asshole and just drive it. Cause that's what all the top people do, but I'd like to yeah, maybe try that's, another way. I don't you know, think that's accepted be, anymore. Yeah. Well, it works. It does work. It I'm works. Like, I see it all the time. And yeah. I just, it's not aligned with what I want. And so I really want to try something else. And again, it's integrating what works because there's no doubt it works and I want to be effective. And I think it's possible to be effective and kind. And it's, it's a fine balance. Yeah. yeah. And um, when I look at my five sons, John, I mean, how old are they? What's the range? 15, 13, nine, seven, two, all boys. Yeah. He's almost got a full hockey team there. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, I mean, you, you get what you tolerate. So th- there's a limit where the child becomes spoiled. It's the same with a team. Like you bend too much without instilling the discipline in the rules, you'll end up with a spoiled child. And that's not good in a high performance team. If you're too hard and you break them and you haven't built the trust because you didn't have their back, you also break them. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine balance of, no, we're pushing the limits here and we can all be more. And then I think it's important also to lead from the front, you know, I, so that's kind of, kind of how I roll with it right now. And we'll see how long I last. Yeah. Thomas, <laughs> you're doing a great job, man. And I really appreciate the time you spent with me. I really do. John Just had a good time. It was nice catch. Lee Mag- Maguire. Thank you. Um, Le Maguire. Yes. Yeah. What is that? It's French means what? It's it, it, it's uh, so it's a Celtic name. My oh, dad's it's Celtic. Celtic. Yeah. Uh, from Brittany in France. And um, and it means the caretaker, funny enough, the like caretaker. the nanny. Look at you, so, the caretaker. Yeah, I'm, I'm the I'm the freaking nanny. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, that, that's the root is, is the caretaker. Is yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, good deal. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. John, anything I can do, just let me know. All right. Take care. You too. Bye.